They teach the kids it all started with a big bang 20 billion years ago. A big bang. This is our infant universe. Everything that will ever exist, everything that will ever happen, all begins here, within this tiny bundle of energy, smaller than an atom. I like to ask him some simple questions. Uh, what exploded? History as we know it is about to mysteriously begin. Where did it come from? And where did the energy come from? Et cetera, et cetera. For reasons we may never know, our universe suddenly erupts. According to the Big Bang Theory, it all started with a little tiny dot and exploded and spread out over all the universe much faster than the speed of light. In a millionth of 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 a second. It went from a size smaller than an atom to bigger than a galaxy. Whoosh. Well, the Big Bang Theory, as we'll see in a minute, is stupid. Yeah, I don't know of a better way to say it. I'm trying to be nice to him, but it is just stupid. The Big Bang idea started with a Belgian astronomer named George something. Can't pronounce his last name. George said that this original matter was no more than a few light years in diameter. At the very least, that would be two, or about 12 trillion miles. So they started off teaching, and a spot 12 trillion miles across was what exploded. Well, they revised that down. In 1965, they said, no, it was only 275 million miles across. Well, that's way down from 12 trillion. 1972, they said, no, it's only 71 million miles across. I don't know how they know this stuff, but this is what they taught, okay? 1974, they said it was only 54,000 miles across. 1983, they said it was the trillionth the diameter of a proton. Within a fraction of a second, the Big Bang creates all the energy that will ever exist. All the energy that will power the stars, that will fuel anything that ever lives. All the energy that you will ever consume dates back to the beginning of time. Now they're saying it's nothing at all. Nothing exploded. And here we are. This is what the textbooks teach. 18 to 20 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe was concentrated into one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period on this page. That's stupid. When you put gas into your car, you're tapping energy that was created during the Big Bang. You're tapping the energy of the universe itself. This one says, all of the matter and energy someday will once again be packed into a small area, no bigger than the period at the end of this sentence. Then another Big Bang will occur. It happens every 80 to 100 billion years. So you can forget about global warming. We're, we're going to get squished. Now this textbook author was brilliant. I could not believe how smart this guy was. <clears throat> he said, boys and girls, nothing really means nothing. You have to be at least that smart to write a book. He said, not only matter and energy would disappear, but also space and time. However, physicists theorize that from this state of nothingness, the universe began in a gigantic explosion. What? <laughs> Yes, boys and girls, you see, nothing exploded, and uh, here we are. Now, who, who can argue with logic like that? Man, they even put this in major science journals like Scientific American. This fellow said, uh, the observable universe, uh, that would be us, could have evolved, there's that word again, you got to watch that one, okay, six meanings, <clears throat> from an infinitesimal region. In the Greek, that means a uh, dot. It's then tempting to go one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. They call that science and put it in a science book. I would call that stupid and put it in the garbage. <laughs> this is what the books teach. I collect them. I've got hundreds and hundreds of these books from countries all over the world, clear back from 1890s up until the 2001 textbooks. They, they're teaching this kind of stuff, folks. This one says, all the matter in the universe was drawn into this little tiny dot. 
and it spun faster and faster. This is what they teach the kids. Some kid's doing this for homework tonight, right? It spun faster and faster. One day, it exploded. Big bang. I was talking to a professor from Berkeley one time. I was sitting on the airplane next to a professor from Berkeley University. I don't know if you folks here in Idaho ever heard of Berkeley or not. But uh, Berkeley is not a Bible college. So we got talking about the Big Bang, and he said he believed in the Big Bang Theory. I said, yes, sir, I figured that. You have to to teach it in Berkeley. Uh, I said, tell me, sir, how did the universe get here? He said, well, 20 billion years ago, all the matter was squished in this little tiny dot, and it was spinning real fast, and it exploded. <laughs> Big Bang. And pieces flew off and became the galaxies and the sun, the moon, the stars, and finally, you know, people. Here we are. I said, sir, could I ask you a couple questions, please? You know, one of my favorite things to do in life is asking questions to people who believe in evolution. I absolutely have a wonderful... That's how this whole ministry started. Twelve years ago, I moved to Pensacola, Florida. Some article came out in the newspaper that said, Dinosaur bones found in Montana from 80 million years ago. I, I wrote my first letter to the editor in my life about 12 years ago. I wrote a letter to the editor. I said, yes, they found dinosaur bones, and yes, it was 40 feet long, and yes, it was found in Montana, but it was not from 80 million years ago. This one probably drowned in the flood in the days of Noah, 4,400 years ago. And you would have thought I shot the sacred cow. <laughs> Actually, I did. <laughs> Boy, there began to be quite a battle in the newspaper, letters to the editor flying back and forth, and finally a, a university called me and asked me to do a debate with one of their professors. Well, I'd never had a debate in my life, except with my wife, and I lost those every time. <laughs> So I, was, I was not excited about debating, but uh, I said, well, how do you do it? What do you want? And the guy said, well, you send us 30 questions, and the other guy will send in 30 questions, and we'll discuss those questions for the debate. I said, okay. So I sent him 30 questions. I thought they were perfectly legitimate, fair questions. I said, a woodpecker's tongue goes all the way around the back of his head and comes on top of his left eyebrow, left nostril here. Would you please show me any fossils that have been found, intermediate species between a normal bird and a woodpecker, you know, with his tongue going all the way around his head? What evidence do you have of how this evolved? That question never came up. I don't know what happened to it. But <laughs> I said, uh, termites chew on wood and they swallow it, but termites can't digest it. It goes into their stomach and there's little tiny critters in their intestines that actually digest the cellulose. Now those little critters can't live without the termite and those termites can't live without those critters. Which one evolved first? <laughs> I thought it was a fair question, but it never came up. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I think they lost my list. But anyway, one of my favorite things to do is asking questions to people who believe in evolution. So I asked this professor if I could ask him some questions about the Big Bang. He said, sure, what would you like to know? I said, well, sir, you told me 20 billion years ago all the matter in the universe was squished in this little tiny dot, and it was spinning faster and faster and exploded. I said, where did all this matter come from? He said, well, we don't know that for sure. I said, okay, now, sir, hold it. If I told you that I believe about 6,000 years ago God created the heaven and the earth like the Bible teaches, you're going to say, and where did God come from? And I don't know. But you said 20 billion years ago there was a big bang, and you don't know where the dirt came from. So basically, I believe in the beginning God, and you believe in the beginning dirt. <laughs> don't tell me my theory is religious and yours is science. Oh, no, sir, they're both religious. The news media tries to make it look like it is religion versus science. I did a debate in El Paso, Texas here recently, and the news media wrote an article. They said, religious and scientific leaders debate evolution. What is the unspoken message in that title? What are they trying to imply? Can you catch that? They're trying to imply that evolution is part of science, aren't they? No, evolution is a religion. Actually, both creation and evolution are inherently religious. These two timelines is the same information right here. I'll be referring to that throughout the seminar here. I get, cover this thing all the time. The Bible teaches about 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a big flood that destroyed everything. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came. Here we are today, waiting for the Lord to come back in about five minutes. <laughs> this is the Bible view of history. On this chart, one inch is 150 years. That's a long time. The 20 billion year chart on the bottom is a very different scale. But see, both views, creation and evolution, are inherently religious. You have to believe in creation or believe in evolution. The difference between the two, though, is very simple. The evolution religion is tax-supported. That's the difference. By the way, if I was to make that bottom chart the same scale as the top chart, the bottom chart actually needs to be 2,100 miles long. That's from Pensacola to Portland, Oregon. I don't want to carry a chart that big, so I made a new scale for the other one, okay? 
If they want to believe it happened long ago and far away, they're welcome to believe that, but that's not science. Evolution is a religious worldview, and I think it is stupid. So I asked the professor, where did the matter come from? He said, I don't know. I said, well, sir, would you please tell me where the laws came from? The universe is run by laws, gravity, centrifugal force, inertia. Who gave the laws? He said, we don't know that either. I said, sir, could you tell me where the energy came from? You know, it takes energy to make a big bang. Who bought the gas to run this machine anyway? Hmm? He said, we don't know that either. I said, uh, sir, could I ask you another question? He said, sure. What else would you like to know? <laughs> what else? What do you mean else? You haven't told me nothing yet. I said, does Berkeley have a merry-go-round? <laughs> How many of you know what a merry-go-round is? You go round, round, round to your puke, okay? He said, no, we don't have a merry-go-round at Berkeley. I said, you ought to get one. You could learn some good science on a merry-go-round. If you put some fourth graders on a merry-go-round, are there any fourth graders in here tonight? Who's in fourth grade? All right, I like fourth graders. I spent the best five years of my life in the fourth grade. <laughs> That's before they diagnosed ADD. Uh, put some fourth graders on the merry-go-round. I like using fourth graders because they're tough and they're expendable. Um, <laughs> and we're going to get the high school football team out there to get that thing spinning clockwise as fast as it will possibly go. Now, if you have a digital watch, you may not know what clockwise means. I'll explain it later. We're going to spin the merry-go-round clockwise. The kids are going to go through four phases. They start off in phase one. They're screaming at the football players. Come on, let's go. Faster, faster. Can't you go any faster? You get up around 30 miles an hour. The kids enter phase two, where they stop screaming. They just quietly concentrate on trying to hang on for dear life. <laughs> you get up around 60 miles an hour. The kids enter phase three, where they start screaming again. But now they're screaming, stop, stop, please, slow down. Don't stop, though. Keep going faster and faster. When you get to about 100 miles an hour, you should enter phase four. That's where the kids begin to fly off the merry-go-round. <laughs> and when this happens, you will notice a very interesting phenomena of physics. If the merry-go-round is going clockwise, when the kid flies off, the kid will be spinning clockwise until he encounters resistance, like a tree or telephone pole. <laughs> That's because of a law in physics known as the conservation of angular momentum. You see, if a spinning object breaks apart in a frictionless environment, the fragments will all spin the same direction. It's very simple. It's because the outside is moving faster than the inside. And so it keeps the same direction of spin. The professor said, yes, I understand about the conservation of angular momentum. I said, well, good. I'd like to ask you a question then, sir. If the whole universe began as a swirling dot, shh, like you said, why do two planets spin backwards? He said, that's interesting. I said, no, that's more than interesting. It's kind of hard on your Big Bang Theory. Not only that, six of the moons are spinning backwards. Why? He said, I don't know. Why do you think they're going backwards? Huh. I was hoping he was going to ask that. I said, well, sir, I believe it's very simple. You see, I believe in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and God did it that way on purpose just to make the Big Bang Theory look stupid. I do believe in the Big Bang, folks. I really do. The Bible teaches the Big Bang. 2 Peter 3.10. It says, The heavens shall pass away with a great noise. In the original Greek, that's a Big Bang. So there's going to be a Big Bang. It just didn't happen yet. That's all. So kids, if you go to school and some professor says, Do you believe in the Big Bang? You should say, Yes, I do. And you better get saved and get ready for it. <laughs> the Big Bang is coming soon to a city near you. <laughs> By the way, if the Big Bang theory were true, the matter would be evenly distributed. But it's not. It's lumpy. They're called galaxies. And in zillions of miles and nothing called voids. And to, to try to salvage the dumb Big Bang Theory, they've got all these wild theories of why isn't the matter evenly distributed? They'll say, well, maybe there's black holes or maybe there's antimatter. Uh, they got all this stuff. It's all trying to rescue this crazy Big Bang Theory. And it's just, it's a dud, folks. It didn't happen. There are zillions of stars out there. I mean, lots and lots of stars. And we haven't even seen them all. If star births, Ought to, they ought to at least equal star deaths, and they don't. We see a star blow up about every 30 years. It's called a nova or a supernova. Well, then how come there are only 300 dead stars out there that we can see, supernovas? Huh. That's only a few thousand years worth, isn't it? There ought to be trillions of them, if evolution were true. This fellow said, I have a little hesitation in saying that a sickly pall now hangs over the Big Bang Theory. Yep. I think it is stupid. Now, if you want to believe it, that's fine. I don't care what anybody believes. That doesn't bother me. But see, the problem is, they want to use my tax dollars to teach that to your kids in our schools. 
And that's where the problem comes in. Okay? If you want to believe in the Big Bang, just enjoy yourself. But keep your religion at home. Okay? Because it is a religion. Then they tell the kids, the earth formed from a hot molten mass 4.6 billion years ago. This is part of the theory, and it's in all the textbooks. 4.6 billion years ago, earth cooled down, formed a rocky crust. I think that is stupid, and I'll show you why. Was the earth ever really a hot molten mass 4.6 billion years ago, and it cooled down? This textbook says, as earth formed, the surface was like the moon. There were hot pools of bubbling lava. I don't think so. My Bible says, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So the earth was not created a hot molten mass. It was created under water, which means it has to be less than 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees centigrade, or it wouldn't be water. It'd be steam. So the earth was never a hot molten mass, according to Scripture. Then when you look in the granite rocks, you find little tiny halos made of polonium. Now, these polonium halos are absolutely amazing. Robert Gentry, a friend of mine from uh, Knoxville, Tennessee area, he has been studying radio polonium halos for a long time. I met him back in uh, the year 2000 and was, went down to his laboratory and I got to see some of the halos through the microscope. These little polonium halos are interesting because they have a half-life of less than a few minutes. If the rock was hot when the polonium, radioactive polonium decayed and sent out the little particles and made the halo, it would melt away. Like in 4th of July, they shoot fireworks up, <laughs> makes a circle. Does the circle stay there? Uh, no, it all falls down, right? There are probably none up there now from the last 4th of July, are there? <laughs> you'd have to freeze the whole atmosphere to keep that uh, sphere in place. You'd have to make, you'd have, this polonium would have to be decaying in a rock that is already solid. So the earth was never a hot molten mass. Get Robert Gentry's book if you want a lot more on that. But all over, the granites all over the world contain these polonium halos. So it is stupid to say the earth was a hot molten mass. We have scientific evidence it was not. Here they tell the kids, though, the earth was hot with large pools of bubbling lava, and that is just stupid. It can't possibly be true. Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. When it's still